welcome to the Presbyterian Church in Westfield. We're glad to have you with us. And this Sunday, we're doing something a little bit different. I want to know, have you ever been asked a question that stops you dead in your tracks, or maybe even bigger, changes the entire trajectory of your life? Sometimes it could be a mentor asking a probing question that sets you off on a new career or educational track. A lot of the time it can be something like an engagement or, you know, a question from a family member that opens up a new future for you. But there are so many moments in our life that have begun in some way or another with a question. Now, in his brief ministry, Jesus used questions over and over again to turn people's lives around and to define now, all these years later, our own lives, to center us once more as people. And I'm asking that you maybe join us over the next few weeks, four to be exact, as we take a fresh look at a few of the questions that Jesus asked in his ministry and reflect on what they have to do with us today. And today, Jesus asked, do you want to get well? Come to the table. Come to the 
So in today's story, at its very basic level, Jesus is coming back to Jerusalem. He stops by the pool. He bumps into a guy. And next thing you know, the guy is up and walking healed. At least that's what it looks like on the surface. And we'll get to that later. But to understand why today's story is not your ordinary Jesus heals somebody story, we need to back up. We need to look at the other things going on in John's gospel around this story. So let's back up a little bit. First context, we're going to be hearing a story from chapter 5 from John's Gospel. And in it, Jesus, at least on the surface it seems, has healed a man. But if we go back into the previous chapter, what we start to see is that Jesus has been traveling. He bumps into a woman, a Samaritan woman, if you will, at a well. And in that story, Jesus kind of tells her her whole life right there. Things that nobody else ever would have known He's telling her. She goes off and she tells everybody in the village, I just met a man who knows everything about me. She is dumbstruck by it. And it changed her life. Now, just after that story, we hear of another one where one of the royal officials has come 18 miles to visit Jesus. And, and in that visit, he comes to Jesus begging, begging, you've got to save my son's life. Well, in that story, Jesus does something else. He tells the man, and really the whole crowd that is assembled around him, do you, and this time it's plural, do you all, do you all just believe because you see signs and wonders? And nevertheless, when the man leaves and gets back home, his servants rush to tell him that his son miraculously was healed, brought back from the very brink of death, he puts two and two together and realizes it, was, it happened when he was talking to Jesus. Well, then we get to today's story where Jesus bumps into a man who is paralyzed. And after this story, we start getting into really, I, I would say, some of the nitty gritty, if you will, of Jesus' fights with some of the religious uh, you know, officials right in Jerusalem. You see, he leaves Cana, and he leaves the, the area around Galilee where he's been, and he comes down to Jerusalem because it's one of the major feast days. He enters in by one of the gates, and it's actually uh, one of the northern uh, gates of the city. He comes in, he walks through, he comes to this pool, and right at that pool, he bumps into a man, and today's story starts. But before we get there, when the man walks away, Jesus tells him to pick up, to stand up, pick up his mat, and leave. It happens on a Sabbath. The Jewish officials at the time, right there around the temple, they see this man walking around on the Sabbath, carrying his mat. They say, hey, you can't do that. You can't do that on the Sabbath. The man has no idea who he's just talked to. They ask him, who told you you could do this? He doesn't know. He just says, hey, a man that I, I just bumped into healed me, cured me. And this sets a new trajectory that will end up leading the rest of the story of John's gospel to increase tension, increase fighting between Jesus and the religious authorities. And it starts with a, a, a caustic conversation between Jesus and these officials where he says, you don't understand who I am. I am the Father. We know what's going on. I'm receiving all of my authority, all of my orders. All that I do is coming direct from the Father. And they are incensed that this man would have the audacity to equate himself as being a son of God. Again, it starts a brand new trajectory in Jesus' ministry that puts it at odds with the religious authorities, leading to his arrest, to his crucifixion, and ultimately to the restoration of all of creation in his own resurrection. Today is a trigger moment for all of that to take place. So, as we, as we start to see what's happening, there are a handful of elements going on. Jesus is exasperated because everywhere he goes, people are looking for him to do healings and to fix them. He is exasperated by religious authorities who fail to see him for who he is and fail to you know, come across and, 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 and realize who he really truly is. 
And just as all this frustration is starting to mount, just as it is coming to a crescendo, we get into the story of today. On the surface, like I said, it seems like a regular, everyday healing miracle of Jesus until we read the details. Now, before we get into those details, the surface level and what lies below, let's read the story together or else we could just really get lost. So after Jesus you know, leaves Cana and comes back down, after this, there was a festival of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called, in Hebrew, Bethsaida. We could also call it Bethsaida, which we even have towns throughout America called that. So this, this pool, called Bethsaida, uh, had five porticos. And in these porticos lay a lot of the different invalids of the city, the blind, the lame, those who have been paralyzed. One man who was there had been ill for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had been there a long time, Jesus said to him, Do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm making my way, someone else always steps down ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. And at once the man was made well, and he took up his man and his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. Now, this is the end of our story for the moment. We know it goes on. We know that the man gets in trouble with the religious authorities. We know that that starts an argument with Jesus eventually. And on the surface, as we said, this seems like a fairly open and shut case of, of Jesus healing somebody. But there's some differences. Now, I don't want to psychologize Jesus and, and get into too much inside of his head, but there are some things, some, cute, some clues of at least what John, the gospel writer, saw in this story as being important. Not only because of where he put it in his overarching story, but some of the things he leaves out. So first and foremost, Jesus comes across this man, and the man does not say, Abba, teacher. He does not say, Jesus, cure me, heal me. The man's not looking for Jesus. He's hanging out in the same place he has roughly for 38 years, just not doing anything, frozen. John chooses to teach us that piece of the story because it's important to realize that there's a different dynamic going on here than in almost any of the other healing stories. You know, in, in some stories, we have friends dropping people down through roofs to get to Jesus, or people grasping onto his, his garments, or people running up to him and saying, please heal me, calling to Jesus. None of that happens here. In addition, Jesus does not ask the man whether or not he wants to be healed or cured. He doesn't ask him, do you want to walk again? He says something different. He says, would you like to be made well? And in some translations, it's actually, would you like to be made whole? There's something else going on here. And in the end, Jesus doesn't say your faith has made you well at all, which is usually what we tend to hear is that the person knows Jesus believes in the divinity of Jesus, believes that Jesus can do something for him, has faith that things can change, and that's what causes the healing. None of that happens. John is up to something new. John is up to something different. And to be honest with you, if we dive closer and really get into the story, I think we start seeing something come to the surface. You see, with Jesus in this particular story, he doesn't know that he's talking to Jesus. He's talking to a man who happens to have just bumped into him. And as Jesus goes along, we hear this weird little story. When, the, when Jesus says, do you want to be made well or do you want to be made whole? The man responds with, hey, look, I don't have anybody to help me. Nobody's taking me to the pool. And, and every time I try to move there, people cut in front of me. They get in there and I can't do anything. And the man's been sitting there, frozen, stuck for all this time, unable to move forward. I think that one of the things that, 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 that at least rings out to me is that Jesus, I believe, because he's not talking about just get up and walk, or do you want to walk again? The paralysis Jesus sees is more than physical. I believe Jesus is seeing in this man 
a spiritual paralysis that he can't move on from. When he says, every time that the water starts to bubble, somebody else cuts in front of me. There's a lot of meaning here, and we would have missed it if we don't pick up on certain clues. You see, at this particular pool at Bethsaida, the idea was that this is a natural spring that was feeding the pool, and it would bubble, and it would churn, and it would move. And every time that it moved, it meant that they didn't know this, but it meant that the, the spring was actually moving through it, and it would cause a current. But at the time, what they actually thought was that this was happening because of some holy means. God was on the move. God was present. God was up to something. They assigned some sort of divine meaning to that movement. And that if you could touch the water, get into the water, submerge yourself into the water when it was bubbling or when it was churning, that would heal you. So the man has been sitting there all this time with all these excuses, all these reasons why he can't possibly, and he's on the edge and he's paralyzed, not simply physically, paralyzed from moving on. Jesus senses this and asks, do you want to be made whole? The response comes and it's this whimpering, sense of helplessness. There's nothing I can do. And Jesus is the one that then acts. If we look closer, what we see with this man is a spiritual paralysis where he cannot move. So let's talk about chronic health issues for a minute, because this is actually a place where I, 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 I personally see uh, situations today that sometimes resemble this. If you've ever talked to somebody with chronic health issues, and sometimes these can be autoimmune uh, issues or a physical impairment, over time, it can feel as though they're helpless. It's almost as though there's this creeping sense of helplessness that takes over over time. You hear of people who have lupus or another autoimmune disorder, and it just wears and it wears and it wears. And every day feels either like the previous or it feels worse than the previous. And it never feels like there's any release, any relief. Now, I only have some tiny personal experience around any of this with a lower back injury that I suffered several years ago that has hampered my, you know, and have been hampered by some limitations in my life, but certainly not to the degree that most people who experience this that have gone through. Others, maybe that have suffered domestic violence, for example, or other forms of, of abuse, have at times talked about the feeling of being trapped, of being unable to escape, of feeling helpless, that there is nowhere they can go to become safe once more. The triggering that can happen at a moment's notice that takes them back into that same mental space where their world shrinks. And it's similar with addiction issues, too. That creeping sense of helplessness, we cannot make a change. No, nothing I can do will ever help me get beyond this. The doubt that creeps in, that tells us that nothing can really ever change. This man has been sitting by this pool for all these years. A spectator watching one after another person come in walk away, at least in their minds, feeling better. That sense of helplessness has left him paralyzed and unable to get well. Regardless of the paralysis happening physically, he is frozen in his own life. Jesus stumbles across a man frozen by his condition that he cannot act. He is not healed, not because he's he's he is not healed because he's worthy, right? He's not healed because of that. He's not healed because he has all the right beliefs. I, in the story, it's made clear he does not even know who Jesus is or why Jesus matters. He is made whole not because of him or his actions, but because Jesus restores all things. That is what takes place. Jesus asked, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made well? Not, do you want me to fix you? 
the man does more than walk. He's made whole again. He is no longer helpless. He even stands up. He walks by himself carrying his mat, and he stands up for himself when questioned by the religious authorities of the day. His entire life has been changed, not only or not just in the areas of mobility and physical ailment. I think it's important for us to be able to talk about that because Jesus does for this man what he is not able to do on his own. That his physical limitations were the beginning point of an entire freezing or being stuck in his own life, a shrinking of his own life. And one question, one question starts an entirely new conversation and direction. It all starts with a question. Do you want to be made well?
Friends, we've come to the time where we celebrate communion together. And going forward, we will be celebrating communion on uh, first Sundays, like we've been doing here in this place, uh, on the video worship series. Now, some of you at home are aware that locally here in the Westfield, greater Westfield area of New Jersey, we have begun to start meeting again in person uh, at both our Wired Contemporary Service and in our sanctuary, both at 10 a.m. Uh, and from now on, we will be celebrating communion on those first uh, Sundays of the month um, each, each time. This feast that we're being prepared for and if you don't have elements out before you go, pause things, go pick it up and, and, and come back and visit us. But these elements have been set before us as simple, everyday uh, parts of our life in order to help us understand a deeper truth of what God is up to in the world and for each of us. See, we are invited in communion to become not only something bigger than ourselves, but we are reminded once more of the restoration that our lives have in Christ. Just as we heard in the story today, Christ comes to us saying, do you want to be made well? It begins here with the celebration of communion. In communion, we confess who we are, the good, the bad, the ugly. In communion, we are fed. In communion, our sins are wiped away. The, the ways in which we fall short of what we could be doing in the world, the, the ways in which we step on each other's toes, all of it, all of it is wiped away through the cup that we celebrate with. In communion, we are restored fully as individuals and as the church to go be the presence of Christ out in the world. Now that we become Jesus, but we become part of Jesus' ministry here in this world. Communion is the starting point of what it means to be a person who, of, of faith in the Christian tradition. It is the starting point of what it means to be church. It is the starting point for all of us. Here in this moment, we are restored and brought back to wholeness. And it starts with a story. It starts with a story. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus, at that last supper, is sitting with his disciples. They've been talking, they've been praying, they've been singing hymns, preparing for the holy night. And on that night, he took up the bread. And having blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And in the very same way, he took up the cup. And he told them this. This is the new covenant, the new relationship with God, sealed in my blood. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, here, celebrating this meal with his disciples, Jesus began a new way of living our faith, of talking about our faith, of remembering not only who Christ was, but who Christ is now. And if you're fairly new to worship with us, or if you're simply shy, it may feel odd sometimes to share your prayers in such a public setting, especially online. But have no fear. If you prefer, you can actually reach out. If you don't want to reach out in the comment section and share with us, you can reach out through the church website to actually talk directly with me about your prayer concerns, anything that might be weighing on you. However, at the same time, I hope that you might consider sharing any prayer concerns that you may have in the comment section of whatever platform it is that you found us on so that we can make your prayers our prayers. Now, this time I ask, join me. Join me here in this moment as we pray together. Gracious and Holy Father, you have, you have been with us since the beginning. In creation itself, you pull order out of chaos. And in the chaos that we have made throughout all of history, you have been there, setting things right correcting your children, giving us boundaries, giving us at sometimes what we think is punishment, but 
often are the consequences of our own actions. In the days of Abraham, you met him as a stranger. And then as a close friend, you guided him, you walked him through his entire life. With the Israelites in bondage, you came, you rescued them, you pulled them out of bondage, you taught them to be your children. Their time in the wilderness was a time of learning to trust you. Even as the fall of Israel and Judah would later happen, you sent prophets their way to guide them back, to give them hope. And in due time, you brought us your son, the one in whom we find restoration and reconciliation of all of creation back to you. And even as we wait for the day to come when all things are made new once more, we know that we trust that what started in him will come to fruition. We ask that your Holy Spirit rest upon these everyday simple elements of bread and cup, that somehow in the mystery of your love, they will become the true spiritual presence of your Son, Christ, feeding us and nourishing us, sustaining us, giving us life, but also giving us strength to live as your children, your servants out in the world, loving this creation you so adore and helping us become light in dark places. We ask at this time that you also listen to the prayers that we bring in the comments. That you pay attention to the cries of your children in all corners of this world. And even so, we ask that you meet us here as we now pray together the one prayer that your Son taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, these before us are the gifts of God given for the people of God. Come, take, eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And this is the cup of salvation offered for you. You know, one of the deepest mysteries of our faith tradition is the affirmation that God meets us just as we are, but loves us too much to leave us that way. We are transformed when we encounter the divine, the holy, when we bump up against Jesus and the world. In our relationships, through our worship, and our prayers, all the aspects of life, really, we grow and we have the opportunity to be truly transformed by our lives and in our lives. I think one of the best ways that this happens has to do with the way that we think about each of our own lives and, I don't know, how we take advantage of each and every single encounter that we have in our daily life. This can be the little mundane moments of sitting in a carpool lane or out in a grocery store or walking, you know, the dog, walking our neighborhoods, being at work. In the so-called church world, the word offering is almost always a stand-in for give us your money. But in reality, it is an invitation to examine how each of our lives becomes a reflection of, of how God meets us. And here's what I mean, okay, to demystify it a little bit. If God meets us right where we are, but loves us way too much to leave us there, then how do we end up doing the very same thing with others we meet in day-to-day -day life? I think that's the question. 
How is it that we become a reflection of Christ's question, do you want to be made well? When we see hurt, when we see pain, when we see people pushed to the margins of society, how do we ask that same question? How do we meet the person where they are? The question I think we could be even asking ourselves is this, am I leaving a mark? Am I leaving a mark in every encounter that I have every day? From the grocery store or even having groceries delivered to the doorstep, to meeting others on the street and in this time where we are re-emerging in our life, how do we make a difference in every single one of those moments? Our time our gifts, our listening, and yes, even the fruits of our labor can all change a life. You can change a life. And so as we go out and start the week ahead, I hope that you will have that lingering in your own minds, even as you ask, how does it through Christ really? It might be working in you. And through it all, I hope that you will remember that you are loved so much further than you could ever hope or imagine and be at peace.